spend the uh, rest of the morning trying to uh, advance some of the governor's proposals. I'm not, I'm not taking votes, but I think we're at the stage. We've heard an overview several times, and we're going to start putting it into a, uh, a bill form pretty soon. Uh, I don't know. Uh, actually, the, the administration has draft language, which we immediately said needs some massaging. And it was revised yesterday, so it is closer to. Uh, Would you mind sharing that with us? Not at all. Okay. Uh, take me a second just to. Uh, so while you find that, I'm going to find my this in the light. Sure. There's a rental fee over in the Wait, while the Secretary's looking at that, we should be thinking about whether, as we hear these proposals, whether we want to like combine them or do them separately. My inclination on housing, I know, is I want to combine a bunch of the issues we've been working on. I don't know that economic development is as suited to that. So we'll see. Just making sure I have the most recent version. And I'm guessing that uh, the preference is for editable word copy something like this. Uh, and we've got drafts ready of uh, all of the various initiatives that I outlined for you to begin with. So the first one I've sent is the recruitment and relocation. Piece, but. So let me ask you this for, to ground us. Um, as I mentioned, I think before, I disclosed that I had talked to, to Chairman Mark Cott, and our understanding was that he was going to focus before crossover on workforce development, and we were going to focus on economic development. With all these drafts that you have, do you have any bills floating around by individual legislators? Or are you? hoping that this committee would put out the bills from here. Broadband has sponsorship in uh, energy and technology, house energy and technology. Um, there are sponsors waiting in the wings for various things, but we were sort of waiting for cues from you and Chairman Mark on how you wanted to uh, proceed on that. I sent an email a few days ago. It's probably lost in the morass of the early part of the session with that inquiry. It's not ringing a bell. What, to me? Yes. What, what, what was the gist of it? Uh, just do you have uh, here? Here's the outline of the various components, and do you have a preference on whether okay. we find sponsorship or you want? Okay, to start well, we'll discuss that in committee. My preference would be that it, the stuff come from here, either okay. individually or as a committee vote. So. Okay. So the way we've got it divided up right now is uh, as that in similar fashion to that uh, the infographic that we distributed. There's a workforce recruitment relocation language. There's a housing package. There's veggie modernization. Broadband package, uh, captive housekeeping, which will originate elsewhere, uh, and an aviation economic development bill, which is something that Chairman Mark is for. So um, he's got that language. Um, in addition to that, there's industrial park uh, legislation that Ted has drafted, and I think the downtown tax credits have been rolled into the master housing bill. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to open it last night. So they're in the master housing package. Okay. Let's, um, maybe we will or maybe we won't get to housing today, but let's start with recruitment and retention. And um, I don't know if the members of the committee recall that, you know, uh, this committee has been a supporter of the department last year, the agency last year in terms of looking to bring people from out of state. There's, you know, there's been a lot of pushback in the legislature that I've heard already about why that's the focus. But uh, one of the, the criticisms that I mentioned was when we learned that the money, the million dollars that was out there was going to go for moving expenses, um, I expressed some concern that that's something that employers usually pick up Anyhow, could we find some other areas to use that money that would achieve the same purpose? And so maybe that's a good start. Answer is absolutely. Uh, the, the initial framing we've got is just a 
essentially placeholders for what things could be paid for, but there, I don't believe we're wedded to, to any of those components. So, um, so you, have discussion. you given any thought as to where, you know, if you had the parameter of $5,000 per relocate or whatever the term would be, um, what other ways you can incentivize to, them to look to Vermont as a Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, based on some of the invoices we're getting now on the remote worker, some of the things that come up are things like lease deposits. Um, so we do think the 5000 can go toward many different uh, possibilities. The question is, do we want to limit it into a particular category or leave it more broad? I, you know, I, advantages, disadvantages to, to both. There may be young people who might want to use that money to defray student debt repayments. You know, there's it, there are many expenses um, for somebody moving other than just a van, you know, paying for the van. Right. I, go ahead. No, I just think that, um, and it may be in the white paper, which I have to admit, I apologize, I have not yet read. But the criteria, I just think it would be great if we had a set of criteria that we could all look at to get a notion of how this isn't just sort of a broad stroke of paying people return. There, I think you're right. Um, we were hoping to sort of refine that with uh, the committees of jurisdiction. Um, so we didn't have a, an initial um, misfire of, hey, they want to pay for X. It, it's really so I'll, than that. So I'll throw in my thoughts, and other committee members could. Uh, I, I would like to see specific things, and I think I had mentioned that lease deposits would be a really good one. Uh, but there can be multiple things, but I wouldn't want it to be a discretionary program right. where you say, well, this guy looks needy to me and this will work. So, But it could be broad enough that it has three or four or five different things like we did with a remote worker. Right. It has to fall right. in one of those things. So uh, I don't know that we need to do it now. We could spend some time brainstorming, but I think what I prefer is for you to go back with your people and have a brainstorming session of, you know, let's come up with a handful of things that might catch people's attention and, f and right. grease the wheels for them to come here. There's two things that come to mind, Senator. Uh, one is sort of in the initial array of ideas that we've got. What things could we invest in that also push other components of Vermont's economy forward or tackle another problem? So you identified broadband, for example, in remote work. We could extend that in this in the other worker component as well. Um, upgrades to housing, things that are going to you know, add to grand lists that are going to employ Vermonters to do upgrades, things of that nature. Weatherization. Uh, weatherization uh, specifically could be um, one of the things. Um, Student debt repayments also uh, always an alluring component. I think we just have to be careful that we're not only. <coughs> I think we would face criticism with just having a student debt repayment option for folks who were, were relocating to Vermont versus existing Vermonters. What did Tulsa, what did to, did Tulsa like do something to pay people's rent? Yeah, they paid a couple of months. I think. Yeah. Okay. That's the, that's the only. They gave cash plus paid rent, or what did they do? I think that was part of their um, package was that it could pay for several months' rent. Okay. So it was yeah. more generous. So I think wearing workforce hat, uh, for me, given we still have so many jobs that are unfilled in Vermont, I would really like to make sure that if we do this, that it's tied specifically to jobs that are needed here so that the that the people who might be being recruited are specific to fill some of these 10,000 jobs we still have unfilled. So that it isn't just random people moving in, but very focused people coming to serve, fill those jobs that we need. Um, so, uh, um, or maybe I'm missing something. I mean, one of the, the factors here is they have to come into a new job. So you're it, saying it has to be more specific than any uh, job? Yes. I mean, otherwise you're just paying people to move. We have specific jobs that are not being filled, right? We've identified 10,000, it was 11,000, we're now down to, I think, about 10,000 unfilled jobs. So to me, 
one of the reasons I might support this is to actually tie that relocation to specific companies who have specific needs so that we're feeding the problem. Yeah. I mean, we're not feeding the problem, we're, we're filling the problem, <laughs> we're solving the We're addressing the problem. Uh, that, could be, uh, that could be a component. Um, do, do you know what I, mean? I know so, you're saying I'm trying to think about how to actually administer that. that. That's what I was saying. Um, because, and there are so many needs, so I don't know what sector does not need work. Right. So I'm just we trying to guide, think about that. As people are thinking, sure. you can guide them to the needs rather than just say, we're going to open this program that anybody wants to come work here in Vermont. And these are our criteria. You say, well, one of the criteria is you're actually filling a job that we didn't have open right. in, in this area. It strikes me that one of the ways that we could refine uh, the pool of, um, of applicants and, uh, and then administer the, the program could be we'd have priority sectors. So if you're in a priority sector, say healthcare, um, child care, Something along those lines that you, yeah. you go to the top of the list and then yes, that you could be prioritized cascade down that. from there. I think that would be. I think that would itch scratch all the more itches than just paying for people to come back or cop. Mr. Chairman, John Young is here from the training program and just has his hand up to your yes. right. Uh, thanks, I thank I'm a little passionate about workforce and I have uh, uh, two young uh, graduates myself. And, you know, I look at uh, one of Vermont's biggest problems is our ruralness, and I, I also worry about our clusters. So, having young men that are college graduates that may or may not be moving out of state, they're looking at clusters of an area. So, if I do make the move to wherever, if this job doesn't work out for me, what's next? So, young people. Like, not just people. Right, right. People in general, right? Um, but I, you know, just thought, could you have a regionality to this where we don't have clusters to sort of incentivize somebody to take the leap that they might not make, like Northeast Kingdom or, or right? And I, I agree. There's another priority you could give to people who are willing to go and work in Springfield or correct that or don't have other clusters. Northeast that Kingdom are or Bennington or La Rock. I agree. Just my thoughts. No, it's because we can really guide this and help spread the workers. Well, the yeah, jobs. I mean, we do want to also focus on this committee on rural economic development, and this is that, that could be another kind of preference. The concern is practically you think, need to think ahead in terms of the administration. It's one thing to give preferences if you're expecting you know, thousands of people to apply right away, then you can sort of look through that and give preferences. But if you're trying to give the money out in a timely fashion as people come, you know, I don't know how applicable the preferences are. Agreed. Yeah. That way, if we were to structure it, so if we got um, applications from the Northeast Kingdom, Springfield, you know, pick the, the spots that the, the legislature's preference to incentivize, um, and also uh, a separate section for sectors that we would migrate to those applications first, um, but leave it open that there's an, a, a quota in those that within the defined time parameter of a given fiscal year that if you didn't get enough folks in those, you could cascade downward from there. And, yeah, and the, uh, there's this timing preferences. I guess there could also be financial pre preferences like we sort of do with, didn't we sort of do something with MC in terms of like giving preference or something like that? So, I mean, you could say we'll give $2,000 if you move to Chipping County, we'll give $5,000 if you move to Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah, I absolutely. think John was getting That's at. That was what I mean. Yeah, because I think you can really wait what, this. What have, what have you, have you got any thought? I, I haven't read the, uh, the proposal thus far, but is there a is there a time frame how long someone has to be out of state before they could qualify or could somebody go and establish say i'm a resident of new hampshire for one day and then i come back and say i'm moved to vermont so i'm moving from out of state here and we have not it uh it, it specifies that we create 
those the criteria, but we don't specify the criteria. Okay. We're happy to flush them out in the, okay. the statute if you. I don't know like that. I, 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 I don't know that for me that I would want to get into that level of minutia, but I, I do think I would want to have an idea of what you're thinking before giving you a blank check. Right. Yeah, I'd like to. I think the way we had it drafted is we were going to wait for the next tax year. It would be based on the net, on the new tax filers. So they would have to wait. It wouldn't be like they're getting a check. A little bit different than what we're doing right now with the mobile. I think that's still on the It is. Right? I'm just trying to goes. play out in my head how that would relate to leaving the state for a, a brief period of time and then coming back to try to take advantage of the criteria, I think we'd have to ask tax if there's a way to jerry-rig that. As I was, as you know I was during the fall, I was very concerned. I was, it's actually, we had originally proposed a tax credit for the remote worker program. Mm -hmm. I got pushed to the grant program and I'm sort of glad we did. But I don't want to, I don't want to see this program somehow if we could avoid it being part of the tax program uh, in terms of like a, I mean, the people are, people are going to move here and view these things as an incentive, for instance, a deposit. They're going to want that money now. They're not going to want to wait to see it 20 months later as a tax credit. Um, so. Um, I, I also think, I mean, this is, I really think we need to think about what we want to incent. So I would agree with John, I, I think we need to fill those jobs. And it, it strikes me that actually we don't want necessarily, we really want people who've been out working. So you, you're going to see, you're going to be able to have a criteria of, of, of job experience. And uh, so that we're not just bringing level entry post-college kids back. I, I mean. That's fine, but quite honestly, I'm the mother of two young men. Coming back here as a young person, if you're not living in Burlington, it's not necessarily easy. It, it's very socially challenging. But in many ways it would be, because I don't want people to be incented to come back, be here for a year and realize I can't meet anybody, there's no social scene here, and leave again. So the, the plus of incenting people with a little more experience is they, mm, you know, they may have seen enough of the world to really appreciate where they are and stay. So do we have a stay requirement? Like how long are we, if once we give you $5,000 for whatever criteria we give it to you for, what's your commitment? Is it a five-year commitment to staying in Vermont? Is it 10 year? It's much easier to do that older, with slightly older mm -hmm. people, 30 and up. Uh, just saying, for my own family that. experience, yeah. I think that's a real challenge to social life here unless right. you come with a partner. I think that's how, and the the original legislation was not ours, but I think the reason it it appeared as a tax credit was the idea of a graduated payment that had an attachment to multiple tax filings. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah, but I mean, maybe that sort of dictates some sort of payment over time. Like, yeah, you know, it's such a pay, small amount. Paying your broadband mm -hmm. bill or something like that. So. If you leave after one month, you're only getting $100 mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, it's not, I mean, this is creative stuff, you know. And yeah. it, it takes some thought not only in terms of the purpose, but also the administration of it. Because uh, it's not really one that's subject to a payback. Right. First, God, good luck trying to get the money. Right. You know. And I'm just coming into this. Right. Uh, it's, well, it's good to see. And, and it's it's, it's, good you it's already much. getting complicated, yeah. and so I would just hope that it doesn't get so onerous that nobody's going to apply. Right. So. That's the I think that's the balancing act we do between filling needs we really have and not making it too complicated. Right. But we also, you know, don't want to make it so loose. That, well, we also right. want to solve some of our problems with. Yeah, and you know the. One of the benefits that the that the um, the agency has been unabashed about is there's value added to this thing just in terms of publicity and attention to the state of Vermont, and uh, you get that as well. I mean, you could probably say with remote worker, 
even if we never gave out a grant, it was worth doing. Because three point two million dollars. Right. Closer to four right. million. Now. Closer to four million now. Right. How do you calculate that? By the by way? impression. <laughs> by the impressions. impressions and their value. Sorry, sorry. What, what oh, oh if you were to pay for that, that's right. right. The equivalency. Oh, yeah, the equivalency. equivalency of all the press we got on the right. workers. We equated that to three point four million. To four million. Oh my gosh. Yes. It's a good what do people want? We're what? talking about what we're going to give them. Mm -hmm. What do they want? Do we know? Um, we, do, we had an extended conversation with Representative Toll about this yesterday. Um, we know what, so there are measurements of people that have come to Vermont or have stayed. We don't have measurements of the people that have not come, so we can't measure the absence of relocation or the absence of business recruitment. So with that as the, the foundation, um, what we know is at the heart of um, people, so we're talking about people, so we'll talk about the people piece. They, the, what people want is, is a cross-section of they're moving because they have an affinity for Vermont um, to begin with. It's not a singular thing. They potentially have family here. They identify with Vermont's ideals, um, our sort of ethos of social responsibility, the ethos of um, taking care of the environment, those kinds of of threads, um, and then what the the next layer is sort of the, the challenges of getting here to to make the move once they have identity. So, so that's the recruitment piece. We're identifying the people that have all those pieces. We start the messaging. Then we're at the stage where we're actually trying to convert them. And what do they want? They want housing that is affordable with a small a. They want a job that is um, that pays commensurate with the cost of living. So not necessarily the Boston, New York pay rate translated to Vermont, but the commensurate rate. Um, and they want a community that's got all of the requisite pieces to live there, education, healthcare, outdoor recreation, the things that we talk about in terms of those regional ecosystems and economies. Um, that's the it's not the 80,000 foot view, but sort of the 30,000 foot view of the themes that we Come through uh, that come through on a pretty much a weekly basis, uh, either in studies done by <coughs> UVM or in just the thousands of conversations we have with folks. Whether they're in the state of state program, they're telling us this through the remote worker program, or they're folks that uh, Representative Toll was talking to on this chair lift at Stowe this weekend. So, and also just to add, we I just happened to look at some of the applications that came in on remote worker and. There's a guy who uh, just moved to Burlington from New York City, but he grew up in Vermont. So it was like a, it was, I couldn't believe, as I'm reading his story, it was classically what we want to do. He'd been away for about 15 years uh, all over the world, and now he resided in, he's back in Burlington. There are about four applications that have been approved. One person moved to Bennington, one to Burlington, one to Essex Junction. I forgot what the other one did, but. We're, there are three people that are willing to tell their story, so we're going to delve a little deeper to understand it. But I think this money kind of tipped them over, and it wasn't the full 5000 In many cases, they claimed you know 2200 was their expense. Yeah. So it was very interesting, and it's also that maybe the money will go further than we expected because of that. Um, we are about to embark on a, a study of people who have moved to Vermont over the last three years understand that better. And that's through the, you know, uh, Faraday, the um, artificial intelligence marketing firm. And we'll, we'll be able to answer that a little bit more uh, precisely. So we don't have the same, this is very interesting, we don't, we don't have the exact same problem on the people staying with the remote worker thing because theoretically they have a job they have with a job. somebody else. They got a job. Right. Um, but I'm thinking that you know one of the things, one of the ideas in terms of the people staying on this new program 
might be to be an extension of the renovation grant and somehow you could take a lien or something and mm -hmm. if they leave you'd, and the house was this is in a house sale which may not be the common place you at least have your equity to get back from that if they left prematurely but so you know there there may be a way to get to get money back, back or get the leave. money out slowly so that at least you know you're not getting people that are just trying it out i don't think many people come here and experience that whole change and not be here for a while but there could be some that yeah. just don't like it and we've wasted money we did hiring bonuses for years uh, in burlington uh, to recruit public safety folks and we had a clawback provision that you had to stay for a certain number of years or you waste the money back we never had to actually implement that there were folks that left and if you did you wouldn't have been able to get it <laughs> we don't know <laughs> generally people were pretty good about right. yeah i understand i need to be here for and maybe it cost to do the program plus yeah. that there's no certainly seen it on the corporate side though and that's the reason we had to change the budget program we're giving people money right. and right. they weren't living up to their obligations or they were leaving or, or what mm -hmm. have you and yeah. Call back even in the business was, was extremely difficult. Yes, and I'd be very concerned that we don't get ourselves into that situation. We'll try to draft some um, some clawback provisions and some ideas. And, yeah, um, and, and because here, you know we didn't think about it with the remote workers, especially in sending they're moving to areas that where we need them to move, not just back to Chittenden County. So. You know, to me, that to tag onto what John said, I, I really think that's a, an important criteria. I took some notes while you were talking. We've got some predefined area, area definitions, uh, labor market areas, new market tax credit right. zones, opportunity zones. So you wouldn't necessarily yeah, have, have to reinvent uh, the wheel. You could add a multiplier right. for the location for those. We've been trying these preferences in a lot of different programs already, so we can mm -hmm. just piggyback. Yeah. This would just be an added. <coughs> Uh, well, frankly, so though, it's a hard about clawback for the amount of money we're talking about. It's just it's just not practical to claw it back. Yeah. The cost is will exceed the amount that you would get back. Well, so, well, if you build it into a contract with them, I mean, you know, we they obviously have to sign something to get this. I mean, be, yeah. be engaged in something to. We're going to get rid of soon for five thousand dollars in Wyoming. Hey, okay, we'll make good use of our small claims court. No, but I mean, judges. There are ways, ways to do yeah. clawbacks that are almost self-enforcing and right. then there's also exactly. paying the benefit out over time which can also I mean that's the incentive to stay but um, but, but the benefits are so small and that's one of the difficulties right. that over time it will, you, you lose the impact and it's the impact that, that that's really important no well yes and no I, I agree generally for the most part but if you think of something like your cable bill mm -hmm. or your internet someone say oh I got five thousand dollars of cable bill that's going to be yeah. free and it, but it's not, instead of getting a five thousand dollar check up front you might mm -hmm. get a hundred for four years or something right. like that so. and, and i think also if you know up front that actually you're being asked for something in return for this mm -hmm. it's it isn't the god it's it's like we've got a lot of we've got a lot of yeah. thinking yeah. Yeah. even as i say the cable thing that's all administrative nightmare you know? yeah. Yeah. We, we'll ask the the tax commissioner i i wonder if it's it, probably can't be but it could be as simple as we put a paragraph in that says there's such a thing as a um, a worker relocation tax it applies if you receive this grant and you leave within X number of years you owe a prorated amount back to the tax department and then it becomes something that gets attached as a tax um, that's different than having to go to the small claims court so yep. we can inquire about something like that so I have one personal question I have to ask. <laughs> at well, we just look over here, making this up on the fly. <laughs> uh, Working on this. Well, I mean, I mean, that is one reason why making them wait for the following tax year is not such a bad idea, we thought, because it's like it shows commitment that they're not just getting here, getting a check, and then bolting. That they get yeah, here, and then the all It's all balancing. Yeah. You know, we've got to think it through. Um, yeah. I so I did have one. I did have one when you're person, done, personal question last. that I've been meaning to ask every time you're here, and I keep forgetting. I actually have my uh, my uh, partner, 
daughter is a perfect person for the remote worker. She doesn't qualify because she came a few weeks prior to January 1st. But she's an architect from LA and she's planning on staying, coming back to a model staying here. But she's, she is an independent contractor. She worked for a business in LA and changed over to an independent contractor status. Still does all her work essentially pretty much through her, but she's got a lot of freedom. And she then went, she came, she asked them, can I do this work in Vermont? And they said yes. So are we missing anything in the remote worker program by not allowing independent contractors who work remotely out of their home to qualify for these for the benefit? Right now they have to have an employer, right? Right now they have to be an employee. Yeah. We may be, but the very complicated. it's complicated. really complicated once you open the independent contractor window because there's so much of the 21st century economy that relates to that. There's really almost there's a lot of verification that has to be done. Yeah, and we would be out of the money already probably if it, if it was open. Yeah, yeah. there's we so got a lot many of people in that. Given the demand already for this, mm -hmm. we'll wait and see, and let's see how it goes for the first year. Mm -hmm. But I think. I mean, she's, she's a, but she's the class of person you want to come to. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But she came anyway. Indeed. She came anyway. Right? Well, that's always a problem with this program. You don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. It's got a little bit right. of a but for element to it. But so for me, some of the hope is that some of those companies may, depending on what their size is, may actually come themselves, the whole company. That is and, cool. You know, just yeah. it, it, it puts our teeth into a tiny little small way into that company and if you get the right does. person who comes and works remotely it's the vice president of or, whatever right. and then they're reporting back to the mothership hey uh, yeah exactly like so that is sort of here. also my insidious you know hope that we've got Connecticut and Massachusetts <laughs> this also goes back to the question I asked before what do people want I, I know from the the other situation of looking at jurisdictions to put business business in I was most impressed by the country that said, we got all these things, but what do you want? We're flexible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ability to construct something that gives a degree of discretion so that you can tailor a solution to that, because every individual has a different need. Somebody may want internet service, somebody else may want a cash grant for, for, for rent, somebody else may, you know, people want different things. And I would like, if we do any of this, to have it sufficiently flexible so that there's some discretion. May I just tag on to something we talked about last year? So you, you will all remember the, the exciting New York Times article about e-residency. And we had e-residency debate was one of the things to consider for the future in our financial technologies report from last year. How might e-residency fit into this? What, because it is, what can we get out of e-residency that would, that might be an incentive? Is that worth pursuing at all? I put that out there just because it is, as you know, um, I encourage you to reread the, what is it? Yes. the Estonia, the New York, the New Yorker article about Estonia. Um, Estonia could offer a lot more than we could offer for e-residents, but is there something we could offer that would and, and uh, financial value we could get from having e e-residents in Vermont? It, some, it, it was a proposal in the financial technologies right. report from last year. Something for us to maybe think about. I don't know yet. What. We we yeah. haven't looked at it this year, Senator. We did look at it last year and didn't find exactly the right threads to, to pull uh, on to, I to make it work. But given this, mm -hmm. you know, or <coughs> what, you know, creating a bigger net and hoping to bring people here, is this an opportunity that would lead to physical residency? Or, you know, how could we make it something that would be a kind of exciting additional? Uh, Certainly, we'd get a lot of press <laughs> if we could <laughs> figure it out. Can anyway, you, can you get a link for us to? Yes, to I'll get you the New Yorker link. Yeah. 
and I'll get those. Or some report from Estonia how it's working. Yes, great. Good point. I will get that. How is it working in Estonia? Estonia has an entirely digital um, economy and, and governmental structure. You, yeah. you can do everything on an app. It's fascinating. They are leading the way. This and Tallinn is a great city to visit. Yeah. Have you been there? Yes, many times. And what took you there? Uh, I have an adopted daughter who was born in Estonia. Oh, wow. Cool. I've been going there for many, many years. You may be our secret weapon here. Does uh, e currency mean that you, mm -hmm. are you able to collect tax on these people? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, but that's one of my questions. Okay, that's the only What's the tax? value? Yeah, yeah, like what is it? <laughs> well, no, but that, I think that's what we'd have to explore. Right, right, right. right. What's the value we would gain mm -hmm. for? Extending, how can we make an American version of e residency work, which no one's figured out yet? So, no, maybe we could be first. Well, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can get people that don't live here to want to pay taxes here. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember from their point of view, we pay a lot less tax. Just everybody's laughing, but from your yeah, European sure. point of view, we pay nothing in tax. Mm -hmm. We are, according to world economies, under tax. So, let's just remember that in the context of Europe in particular for under tax. So actually, it might be an attractive thing. Go figure. Something tells me the Europeans are going to be angry if someone's trying to extricate themselves from paying tax in their home country <laughs> by being a Vermont e-resident. Well, <laughs> they may do that in addition to wherever their jurisdiction is. It, doesn't sure. necessarily, it, it could be have a, a, a corporate and financial advantage that and give them access to markets or something that they don't have otherwise. And that is what we need to figure out. Okay, so we, we, hey, baby, let's shake it up. Okay, so we spent about 40 minutes on the new proposal. Uh, what else, what's a good segue from that in terms of continuing on recruitment? Uh, do you your, have, your, is yeah. there anything that you want additional information on? on the? So that's the, the back end. Um, proposed million dollar investment. The front end is the actually the recruitment component of that, which has two large buckets, the statewide strategy and then regional investments. Right, yeah, let's talk about that again. Okay. okay. Uh, so the, the 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 two pieces would weave together to create one unified strategy, but with two buckets of investment. Uh, the first would be the statewide uh, marketing initiative. Uh, that would be inclusive of the state's economic development marketing plan, which is something that you created in 2016 prior to, to my arrival, uh, that has been invested in, um, in one, one year increments for the last three years. How so that would be included. Sure memory of the monetary that was the 200,000 last year. Uh, it, I think it started at 200, then we created the plan, uh, and then we went, we got carry forward funding each year thereafter for 250000 So how much is in the governor's budget this year? It's all enclosed it's into this um, $2 million. Uh, no. So rather than add another fragment, what's being suggested is this million would include economic development marketing add the statewide recruitment effort, which would be um, partnering with firms to do the digital analytics, to do the messaging, and to create that conversion funnel. Simultaneously, an investment in regional recruitment and marketing strategies around the state so that individual regions of these um, regional economies and ecosystems could create their own. I think I need my infograph. Yeah. yeah, the end of breath, and, and actually some of that is in, in the white, white paper. It is in the white paper. Um, and the white papers are in this in this manila envelope. That's yes. how it'll stand out. There's some compelling work going on in some of our RDCs and with young professionals groups and chambers of commerce and pockets around Vermont doing uh, marketing and recruitment. And what we're suggesting is rather than invest it all in one centralized effort out of the agency, we'll have a centralized effort, but then we'll also have investments in these regions to create a fabric of messaging for the entire state that has some region specificity that allows them to do more with, uh, with the resources that they've got. Doesn't create additional fragmentation because the entities and the efforts already exist. It's just additional um, 
investment into them, and that all rolls together to create this unified effort. And one of the reasons economic development marketing is rolled in there is we don't want to just continue to create additional fragmentation and another program and another thing. If we weave it all together, we think we're going to get better results uh, and better. But there'd be uh, one marketing outcomes. plan. Yes. One, yes. So because they can't afford. I mean, we'd have one in that strategy. Point, it makes one strategy and one purse that it's paid for. Out Correct. Of. And then follow up regionally. Yes. Exactly. That's sort of it. In a simplest. I think that's a great description. Does the white paper um, have language that you're asking for? Any legislative language? The legislative language I sent to Kayla um, a few minutes it. ago. Um, it's a it's an expanded version of what we shared with you last week. It's just a format of a little better. And, um, Is that this? Yeah, it starts out yeah. with economic development yes. marketing, section three. Did you get the correct one? I, I, I'm just giving Michael one you gave us last week. Okay. I sent an updated one, and sometimes when you send it out of the... Uh, I did. Uh, I'll try again. Stand by. Stand by, yeah. Uh, so, is this... That's what it should look like. Uh, I think that's the one you attached. To the, we, so we, you're, you're envisioning this, forgive me that I'm playing a little catch up here. You're envisioning this as being not separate from the budget bill. This language, whatever it ultimately comes out, it's not that long, it's not that specific, and it's not that much. Maybe it is, I haven't really focused whether it's, it's, a big, it's a big policy change or not, but are you envisioning this in the budget bill, or are you envisioning a separate Standalone bill. However, the legislature would like to proceed, I think, is is fine. It's in the governor's proposed budget, um, so there's a placeholder there. Uh, but we're not. I don't believe we're wedded to one direction or the other. Um, can you explain to me in like a minute whether it represents an up or down in this area in terms of? Budgeting. It's enough. And in addition to the one million dollars for recruitment that we just talked about for the last three payments, how much is enough? Is this another one point four million or something? It's two point five in total. A million in, in the recruitment initiative. Right. Five hundred thousand to the Department of Labor for relocation and a million in the incentives. Okay, so in now, aggregate, now, it's probably 2.25 up, but because okay. we're taking an economic development marketing role. Got it. Okay, so describe those two, two or three other pieces, relocation, uh, incentives. The incentives are the component that we were just, working just on for about. the first 40 minutes. The oh, okay. Grants. That's the, one the, the grants. That's, okay. that's as drafted as a million dollars. Okay. Uh, the million in the, the first million is the, the relocation component, which I just described, the central effort and the economic development marketing tie-in, and then the regional component. We're all weaved together. And then the middle piece is, so first piece you so find. Is that, like, is that like similar to Think Vermont? Relocation? It, it yes. It oh, just because it's the marketing piece. Yes, so. it incorporates those components. So it sounds like a unified marketing plan uh, that then would be distributed and access regionally. Yes. Right. I should also say the uh, we're missing uh, the commissioner of tourism because of an illness this morning, but she would also tell you that this million dollar spend also would bolster our tourism efforts because we would weave in the state to state program state -state. and uh, try to leverage <coughs> a number of creative ideas they have around converting visitors to being residents. So there's. The potential for, and I think we're already seeing, an increase in tourism visits as a result of the recruitment effort as well. And again, it's we're trying to unify this, so we're not asking for some money in here, and we're asking for money there, and we're asking for money here, and we've got these three tiny fragments. We want to really make it a unified, meaningful effort that will achieve multiple outcomes. So the 
effort is the marketing, then the cream in the middle that's DOLs that is the is the So now we got the people the on the skill hook. boot up or the, the people connecting people are on the hook. Are. So you got the fish in the pole and now DOL's we, job will be to uh, assist those folks with relocation. And that effort takes two paths as well. A centralized effort at DOL, there's a little bit of technology woven in there, there's some supervision of the relocation effort, and then there is also a uh, regional investment as well. And as last drafted, they're working on a new draft right now, I, I think it was paying for three regional recruitment uh, specialists that would be in the field reporting back to, to DOL but at RDCs or some <laughs> or other. Or at our one-stop portals, or building our exactly. robustness of these one-stop portals where they would then go and then find, find out all the programs they could access and all the support they could access for federal money, state money. I mean, they don't care yes. about that. They just care about what it is. That the housing components, so just helping, Make personalizing the actual relocation versus having it be all digital and asynchronous. But that would be regional. Yes, regionally. Uh, well, that's where our one stops are. Yeah. So if we drive business to the one stop portals, they send them. Yes. We've been really mindful about trying not to create a bureaucratic, monolithic thing that lives at National Life or at DOL to really put these things out in the field so as much we, as possible. The, 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 you wouldn't need these kind of, I mean, it's. We need a sort of a holistic recruitment yeah. and retention program. So when people attack, like our remote worker or stuff like that, mm -hmm. and say, "Let's well, only a small part of this," yes. and we we'll all get different ways. So in this particular context, these kinds of services wouldn't be necessary for the people in the first million dollars because they're already have expressed their interest. They've got a job. They're coming here. And so we don't need to like help them anymore, right? Those folks could take advantage of those services, but they'd also be available more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, so we would I don't think we would want to shut them off from using the relocation agents. Uh, but it, they would also have broader impact for folks. Like with remote worker, we've got a variety of people that are now in the relocation pipeline that may not be part of the grant uh, okay. program. So we want to be able to provide them with uh, the path here as well. Right. Yeah, I mean, not a, I mean, I would love it if everyone who came was tied to one of the jobs we need to fill, but they're not all necessarily going to be that. And they they may be bringing other family members yeah. with them who need, who need that kind of assistance. So the hope is we're not just relocating one at a time. <coughs> that we're, there's family units or there's and kids, kids for our schools and kids for schools, which is why I again of more experienced workers coming in is also helpful. You're thinking like the commissioner. <laughs> I, well, I'm just thinking how big the problem is. And you know, we aren't, you know, to fill it here is great, but we also need to fill it here, here, and here. <laughs> this a lot of birds with one step. This is your, <laughs> given that you got the green light for two and a quarter million dollars, this is your best thinking as to how to spread the money around. It is, and it, important to note that in the in that first million in the in the, the recruitment bucket, we had an original draft that specified we're going to spend a hundred thousand in state to state, we're going to spend two hundred thousand in target identification, etc. And our best thinking was it probably doesn't make sense to be that granular because we want to be able to invest in the things that are working and not be pigeonholed to have to spend X on this bucket. If that bucket doesn't work, we should spend zero, and we should spend more in the bucket that we're finding that works. We're confident that this strategy will work because we're already using it in tourism. So using analytics to identify the targets, we can then tell who's clicking on messages, who's pulling on those threads to visit particular properties, and then for some cross-section of them, we can actually tell when they come to Vermont, when they arrive, how long they're here, where they are. Not their names. We're not No, no, but not this tracks us and tells us correct. what we're doing. We're not collecting biographical information. But we can tell that person 127 
started in Buffalo, New York yes. on October 1st of 2017 looking at tourist properties that they wanted to visit in Vermont. They arrived here January 8th of uh, 2018 and we're here for four days. It's frightening. This is and this and is great. So the most the important world. piece is that actually I'm, I'm glossing over. We can tell which channels, so hotels.com, kayak, what was the channel that that grabbed that person and made that conversion. That's how we want to invest this money, is the channels where we're seeing the highest conversion rates are the places we will make the investments, instead of just saying we're going to spend X on here and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. That needs to be, we think, a malleable, um, a malleable effort. You're for suggesting the we should be very, very careful about privacy legislation. That we right, have. exactly. Um, this ties into? Well, I don't, we don't want to collect We're going to put you out of business before you even start. Yeah. <laughs> this is, we don't want their personal biographical information. Just that. But that there is just right. a number. There, we, yeah, there, yeah. there is a, actually, it's not true. There is a point where we do. Sure. When they so engage right. with the relocation yes. agent, when they pull on the thread and they come to a Think Vermont website and they say, I'm now signing up for the newsletter, but it has to be a conscious yeah. effort, not we're choice. grabbing it's your choice. information yeah. by aggregating. But at the point we sign yeah. up, they sign up, they we're going to look back yes. at their trail Correct. to say, how did you get here? Because we want to get other people to do the same thing. Correct. Exactly. Which again, so we've got to be very careful with what we pass with respect to privacy unless we want to stop this effort. But it does remind you that the state is one of the biggest users of the right. data that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, your goose is cooked the minute you pull that thread. And, you know, it just is making me think we should have legislators volunteer, volunteering every weekend for every major ski area to ride the chairlift. Just, you don't need to ski, just ride the chairlift. That's a great idea. And, talk, and to talk to the, add it to the language. Was that, was that a good chairlift ride for us? For Kitty, yes. It was a good one for Kitty. <laughs> Kitty Tall. Those conversations are invaluable both for the intelligence that they gather, but also just the engagement, because that person, well, in this case, it was a person that's already relocated here, but imagine it's a person from Massachusetts who says, I rode the chairlift with a senator from Vermont, and here's what they told me. Yeah. And I got to tell them this, and I mean, that becomes legendary. Yeah. So, you know, I think a program where we got a benefit of a ski ticket once a month would not be a bad thing. <laughs> Wait, is that what I said? <laughs> So if you were to um, if you were to have twice the amount of money appropriated for this on this two point two five, is there an element that jumps out of you that could use a, more of an infusion of dollars than others in this program? I don't know that we would invest that we would suggest investing more for the first year. Um, I think we've got it as close to right size as we can make it. Uh, I'd have to go back and think about it, but I, my initial reaction is I would invest more in um, in the other areas that are potentially barriers, housing and broadband come to mind. Right. Well, we're going to invest in housing. Yeah. Out of this e residence. Yeah. So, housing. It, that's not to say next year we don't, we wouldn't, if, if we execute this as framed, we might find that in the first year we don't have to spend as much in recruitment because it's less expensive than we anticipated, in which case we should make adjustments there. It, and likewise, if we find that it's a little more expensive than we anticipated, we can come back and let you know that. But we're, we're very mindful about just not trying to blanketly grow programs in bureaucracy for the sake of growing. The agency's you, budget. If we want to talk more about the relocation the 500,000 in VOL, uh, and I know we have talked about it a little bit, should we have the, is the commissioner the best person to have in? Uh, cross section, I believe, of the commissioner, uh, Sarah yeah. Buxton, and uh, those would be the starting yeah. points, I think. Yeah. So, in terms of uh, what is it? the stay, stay and stay, 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 stay. stay to stay. Four stay new weekends stay. announced yesterday. What? Four new weekends announced yesterday. So are we? Where are, are, are we? 
expanding the budget for that this year, your proposal? We don't have a budget for that right now. We're, we're bootstrapping that out of our existing budget. It doesn't have a particular line item. Part of this million dollars would go to bolster the state of state weekends. Right, right now, they're still in the four pilot uh, communities. Our hope is to bring them statewide. There's a um, there's a list of communities that are just waiting to deploy them, um, and we just we don't have enough resources right now to, to do that. So, so where are the four communities you've targeted? The same. It's the same. Oh, it's the same. report on that program? Yes, it, yeah, right here. Thirty-two percent conversion rate in its initial pilot Very year, with seven people moving to Vermont and nearly forty more actively job. The white paper. The white oh, paper. That's part of the package. Okay. Yeah. So but Wendy, Wendy shared that with okay. us when she was we here. We tried to make them short and succinct, but it's still a lot of paper because it's a lot of. Paper. No, he's done a good job. It's okay. This is good. He's your, he's your benchmark right here. He'll tell you whether he did a good job. One page. One page. <laughs> no, I think you, yeah, I think you have. I, mean, I think you're the king of infographics for sure. That would be Heather. And she's Heather. right here. Thank Heather you. is here. Thank you. Heather, are you unleashed on other agencies or are you only at, at ACCD? Well, it's interesting. Uh, ACCD tends to pilot these things and then other people see them and say, hey, can I have that? So, yes, so we try and Oh, good. It's possible. Good. good. That's great because I'm going to encourage some other places to come to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have to send our balance back. I think we'll take a break. Too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's a good time to break unless you have it things you want to add. At this point on recruitment? Uh, I think the timing's perfect for okay. break. Hello. Hello, you can do it. So we'll take a break till, till uh, yeah, We just did our best work for the last time. I know, I know. Here's what happens. Like, I'll I'll be be yes. I interviewed Dave Graham. And then I'm Peter Graham. Are you house? Okay, so we're just going to continue briefly with recruitment to there was one loose end I wanted to hear about dealing with the remote worker program there. I mean, it's just been up and running since January, but apparently there are some tweaks that have been identified from the agency's perspective, so we're not sure what you're looking for. Sure, do you, need, do, you need do you need legislation for it? So in the current legislation, it the, the the qualifying expenses are defined as costs that are necessary to perform his or her employment duties remotely. And so relocating to the state will never be considered something necessary for somebody to do their business, to do their job. Okay. And so it, it would mean that nobody would be, you know, there'd be nothing eligible. So we are, have not implemented that way. We've said, cost incurred for moving to the state plus any of the following, and we'd like to change that like as soon as we possibly can, just so that it makes practical sense. Well, you know, we, I'm not sure I totally okay, so, follow that reasoning, uh, putting um, my, my lawyer hat on. Right. It. It's, so I'm looking at what we're proposing. I need to look at what the, the way the legislation Maybe actually act. reads right now. The new one? The, the the way actual um, most recent no like the oh, the, the existing the existing language the way it's uh, yeah, I it just so the way the existing language reads it says that you could be reimbursed for costs that you require for doing your job remotely and you and you and you you legally think that coming here would Good never night. be a requirement to do your job remotely. But so, but it also could be interpreted that if you do move your job here to in order to do it effectively, these things are required for you to do it effectively. So, what, so I'm not sure I agree with your interpretation. But if I, let's assume I do, you're what are, you're implementing it now to say that nobody can get repayment for a relocation expense, or they have to have a relocation expense on something else? Yeah, so, I think yeah. I'm just suggesting that a, a, an enhancement to the language would add some clarity. Okay, but what what are you doing, how are you interpreting the statute now? 
So right now, the statute reads, qualifying remote worker expenses means actual cost a new remote worker incurs for one or more of the following that are necessary to perform his or her employment duties. And it mentions A, B, C, D, A being relocation to the state. Right. And then computer software, <laughs> broadband membership. We don't think anybody would be able to claim that relocation to the state is necessary to perform his or her employment duties. But your goal is to make that a reimbursable expense, right? Correct. Okay. So what are you doing now in terms of if somebody claims one of those expenses? That, that would be eligible. Relocation expenses would be eligible reimbursement. You are interpreting it that way, but you're Correct. concerned that that's... Correct. So you want to clear that up. Right. I disagree with you, but we'll work okay. on it. I don't think it's. I don't, I don't think it's. I don't think it's necessary, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't sound necessary. Yeah. I mean, well, we would certainly at your discretion. I know yeah, you find I mean, it hard to believe that multiple lawyers may differ on their interpretations of various things. Well, there is. To, to our defense, there are many Supreme Court cases that would that say that when they interpret laws that. Legislature would never pass a law that was meaningless. So you're trying to say that putting that in there is inconsistent and meaningless, and the court would say their intent was to cover this expense. Otherwise, it would come to a. Uh, why would why would you put the words in there? If you didn't want to do it. So anyhow, is the sky going to fall if you don't change the language? No. We just okay. want you to be you know okay. on the okay. Yeah. All right. We'll, 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 we will look at it. Okay. Uh, so I want to have Doug Farnham come up. He's been waiting patiently on a narrow issue here. He's been rewriting the tax code well. He <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, a whole new enforcement duty. Um, Hi, Doug. So, uh, Doug, you can introduce yourself, but um, we want to hear about the governor's proposal on land gains tax, and specifically if any thought, I'm interested if any thought was given to, instead of totally eliminating, shortening the period, okay? Yes, so for the record, uh, Doug Farnham, Policy Director and Economist for the Tax Department. Um, and so to, to answer the first question of was any thought put into shortening the period, uh, we put a great deal of thought into different ways to modify the tax short of full repeal. Um, and shortening the repeal period, or sorry, shortening the holding period was one of the ideas we considered. Um, and. Sorry, could you remind those of us who yes, have. Yes, sorry. Just to describe the land gain tax. Describe yes. the whole land gain tax. Some of us have been lucky enough to be on Ways and Means or a little more for that. Yes, and, and, and from this committee's perspective, one of the reasons that I think it should be of concern is um, the argument is made we need to repeal it because people are uh, not willing to rehab some houses because they feel like they have to pay this steep tax if they speculate and flip it and turn it over. That's counter to some of our policies is we want some rehabilitation to be yes. done. So, and could we do a carve out for that exact yeah. purpose? I mean, why do we have to obliterate something? Anyway. Um, I'll try to make that argument later. But first, the uh, so the land gains tax was enacted in 1973, uh, shortly after, well, several years after uh, Act 250 was created. At that point in time, uh, municipal zoning only existed in a couple of the larger communities, and Act 250 was still. It took several years, at least, to, to be mature. To mature, the the lore, the anecdotes that we've heard in talking to different members of the real estate community and uh, conservation community is that one of the main motivators behind the creation of the land gains tax was uh, it was land speculation, uh, largely in southern Vermont, and the activity of buying um, land from agricultural land from farmers or other people. Uh, dividing it up into spaghetti lots, 10-acre lots, and, and selling it very quickly to, to make a profit, which had the undesirable effect of raising property values 
on Vermonter. So part of the goal was to prevent speculation, not just to prevent fragmentation, although that was a goal, but also to prevent land from becoming unaffordable for uh, long-term residents of Vermont. Um, so that was the, uh, the framework as described in the 1980 study done by a couple of PhDs that I reviewed prior to tackling um, how this tax can be modified or repealed. And the time frame, just how long you have to hold the land before it's not subject to it. Right, so the, the time frame is six years, and the tax rate is determined by the holding period, um, so basically less than a year, less than six months, scaling out to, uh, it's a progressive rate, but on two different factors. So it scales from 80 down to, I believe, 10% might be the lowest, um, based on the percentage of gain above basis, so whether it's 0 to 100, 100 to 200, or over 200, and then the time period. So if you're under six months and over 200% gain, then you're looking at an 80% capture of the gain. That is in addition to the capital gains that you would owe at the end of the year, federally and to Vermont when you file your tax return. So if you try to sell a property within six months and make that much gain, mathematically you would end up owing more money than the gain originally existed as. Can I ask a question? Uh, <laughs> does that gain apply in the event that there's a stock sale? In other words, a corporation owns a piece of land, transfer, uh, sells the shares in that corporation that's the owner to another corporation, uh, are they then exempt from that tax by virtue of it being a stock transaction rather than an actual sale of the property? So the land gains tax is hooked to the definitions used for property transfer tax, which do not apply to situations that we call consider stock transactions, controlling interest transactions. There's a reporting requirement for large stock sales, but it really just requires them to notify the department that it happened. And it's, there's no specificity or enforcement authority on the quality of the data. It's essentially, it becomes a loophole, but if I want to do this and evade that tax, all I do is put it in the name of an S-corporation, sell the stock in the S-corporation, and I don't have to tax at all. Right, but for context, the, land, the property transfer tax is about 40,000, or sorry, 40 million a year, mm -hmm. uh, 45 in the most recent year. And sorry, land, land gains is 1.75 million. I don't think there's full reporting on the land gains tax as much as there's on property transfer tax. In, in talking with members of the real estate community, um, very few buyers or very few people are aware coming into a transaction ahead of time that they're going to hit a land gain situation. So the question always comes up of, is this impacting behavior? Is it deterring behavior? And because they're not aware of it ahead of time, it's unlikely that it's really right. stopping them from coming into the market until they actually get into the nuts and bolts of a transaction. And then the report from the attorneys has been, this has killed many transactions once they started trying to work something out. And then they figure out that either they have to wait, if they own the property, they have to wait, hold it for four or five more years um, before so they- So you're, they you're not concerned it. that there's not collection because of an attorney's involved in the closing and they're gonna make sure that if there's something owed, it's paid. So yes, there's always an attorney involved. Uh, we believe that most of the attorneys understand and are complying with the law in this regard. Um, if, the, if they're not complying, it's a lack of understanding and not an intent issue. Um, the, the source of potential underreporting would be the, the complexity of the tax itself and the number of exemptions in different situations which, which cause it to be um, exempt. And then the attorney has to rely on the client reporting basis. Because this is a tax on gain, it has to be linked to the basis for the transaction. Right. And then properly qualifying that basis, whether it's maintenance or improvement to the property, mm -hmm. is very difficult for most normal people Which to understand. That's why we can't modify it, it's harder to modify. Yes, and, and that's where the greatest deal of complexity comes in, is proper qualification under the federal rules, because we link to the federal rules for, for what, is, what is a gain, and what is an allowable write-off against um, so, against your name. So I'm sure uh, not I'm fully understanding the answer to my question. 
as to whether or not it is possible to evade the tax by using corporate tax sale. So to, to directly answer your question, if a property were to be transferred to new ownership through, through the stock sale process, it would not be subject to the land gains tax because it's linked to transfer of title. Mm -hmm. And in, under our law, currently, title hasn't officially transferred. Ownership of the company, the corporation, or LLC, or partnership has transferred. So anybody, particularly in a larger transaction, would use a stock sale to evade both this and also the land gain tax, the, the uh, property transfer tax. They could, but there are 2,500 land gains. Well, so property transfer would be a greater concern. Mm -hmm. There are 2,500 land gains transactions a year compared to 25,000 or so property transfer. And only three to 400 result in a taxable liability in land gains. So it's not necessarily the amount of tax that is being transmitted for land gains. It's the burden and the preparation that is, is the biggest hurdle. And in the situations where the tax isn't being paid in, in 2,000 and 100 out of 2,500 cases, a lot of those, the buyer has to certify that they're going to move in to, for no liability to be assessed, mm -hmm. but they get a statement saying, if you don't move in and occupy this as your principal residence, you may up, owe up to 20 or 30 or $40,000. The average amount of land gains tax when it is due is over $10,000. So it can be a disincentive or frightening to someone and make them not want to buy. And especially if they're planning to build a new home, mm -hmm. if their plans fall through and they can't build, there is a chance, and the department has done it, where we have to send them a bill for over $10,000 of land gains tax because they failed to build and occupy as they said they would. Um, so in, in response to Senator Brock's question in terms of a property transfer tax, which is a bigger issue, do you think that's a fair situation where people can avoid the tax by just doing a sale by tax by stock transfer? Which I would add is, is a more likely situation in a large commercial transaction than in the sale of a small home. So neighboring states do have a slightly different structure to where if there's real property involved, it doesn't matter whether it was linked to title or not. That certainly apply, applies more broadly and more equally to all transactions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from a policy perspective, we are a little bit inconsistent with neighboring states. Um, I think this does have to do with the fact that our definition behind the property transfer tax hasn't been updated in some time. And just it was created before the structure of LLCs and partnerships was really it may have existed legally. I don't think it existed legally. But even if it did, it wasn't really prevalent yet. So it sounds like you wouldn't be adverse to updating our definitions. I think there are a lot of impacts to an update in that, of that manner. But from a basic tax policy perspective, most of, the, most of the material out there from different policy think tanks would say it makes more sense for this to be applied to um, controlling interest as well as just to not hook it to just the transfer of title because that's an outdated concept that doesn't necessarily apply in all situations. So just so the rest of the committee, <laughs> I've got a great co-sponsor in my bill that corrects this problem, Senator Brock, who, um, so now we have the administration on record supporting our bill. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to bring in millions of dollars to the state of Vermont. Well, I think that's one of the things, though, as part of this bill that I'm going back and looking at is large transfers, uh, particularly corporate transfers that involve the transfer of land through ownership of the corporation in recent years. And I suspect around Vermont, we've got some multi-million dollar issues of property transfer that have occurred in that fashion. Yeah, that, that's that's multi-million in terms of tax liability. It's much higher in terms of the value of the transfer. Right. But anyhow, we digress. Um, this, is a, this is an issue we'll probably take up in finance. I think our bill was referred to the finance committee. Um, but going back to land gains, if I could, 
Yeah. Go ahead. That's if you have a question, question go, ahead. go ahead. No, no. After you. you okay. So my I mean, I my question, question is, we have one point eight million dollars that we're giving up by getting rid of this tax. If the primary goal was to allow for the renovation of properties, is there a way to maintain the land gains tax on other elements that are now being taxed by the land gains tax and, and somehow exempt out the renovation and improvement situations that probably will take place within one or two years of, of resale? So the difficult thing in, in, we looked at how to propose a revenue neutral structure. But the problem that we encountered in that, and I actually did most of the work personally, so I guess I could say <coughs> is that when I looked at the actual transactions that were being charged, they were exactly the type of transactions that we would talk about exempting. So the situation where someone is taking agricultural land and then reselling it and getting a, and getting a gain, I could not find a, simple exa a single example of that. What I found were estate transfers that saw a step up in basis and then a gain above that. And then they ended up paying corporate transactions within downtown districts or within developed areas. I could not find in the top 40 sellers an instance where the money came from a payer that would have been considered a speculative transaction that we would be wanting to prevent and still continue taxing. So we looked at uh, writing in an exemption to um, all village and downtown districts. Right, because that's the first place. That's the first place the mine might go. And it's near, It's very difficult to evaluate because our grand list um, is not currently linked very well to actually pinpoint you know, where in Vermont physically that property in the grand list is. We have a lot of work to do improving that data. And we're, we're working on it, but it, BCI has been working on it for a number of years. Um, yeah, but our, our, our mapping in all of our designated villages and downtowns is pretty clear on what's in and what's out. I mean, I'm barely clear in Woodstock where that is. Yeah. So my guess is every lister is pretty clear on where that is. Well, we have the overall lines. maps, but acquiring a list of the spans to compare with the tax return filings is, is difficult at this point. So. Um, I'm, I'm, we're working on evaluating those top transactions to see whether they fall in a, a um, downtown or village district at this point. Um, but it's, it's hard to say for us right now. We, um, we're struggling with that. But evaluating the type of transaction, um, if you were to uh, excuse you know, corporate to corporate transactions where nothing is changing in the nature of the property, because that's one of the ideas we came across is that if there's no evidence of subdivision, 87% of these transactions don't involve subdivision. So basically, zero change to the acreage or less than 0.1 change to the acreage, meaning it was a minor, minor adjustment and they're not chopping things up. Um, that would eliminate nearly all of the tax revenue. Um, Allow putting in an exemption for downtown and village districts would eliminate nearly all of the revenue from what we can, from what we're what we're seeing right now. So the ways that we would put in exemptions to make this logical and to make the right payers um, would result in a tax structure still existing, but very very little tax revenue being generated. And currently we we spend 11 cents on the dollar to to administer this tax. And then that amount that we'd be spending to maintain that structure for the existing, usually exempt filings, would would just would go up further to where we might be spending more than we're collecting. But you, didn't you say earlier, and there were a bunch of reasons you gave that um, the tax, in some cases, sours deals and acts as a deterrent. So if we went the route of exempting. Senator Clarkson said either downtowns or you know renovations or stuff like that. Even though it would um, eliminate a lot of the taxes that you're collecting now, just having the tax on the books could that still yes, prevent dis 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 prevent dis the kinds of transactions we're trying to prevent that we just don't see now? And if you remove the tax entirely, maybe those kinds of 
yes. uh, transactions that we don't like will start coming forward. I know there are proponents that, that <coughs> still believe the deterrent value of having the tax on the books does, does create some value. Our argument is that municipal zoning is prevalent now and nearly in every town. Wish. And that Act 250 combined with municipal zoning is enough, per, is enough protection to prevent the type of activity that the tax was created to, to prevent in the first place. From a revenue perspective, um, this is just, this is partially just an anecdote based on my experience with the property transfer and conversations with the community. But if the removal of the land gains tax were to stimulate the economy in the real estate economy, even by 5%, that additional property transfer tax revenue would balance out the loss of land gains tax revenue. I'm not claiming, I can't, I can't provide evidence that that would happen, but I think it's fairly reasonable that it might happen, that a 5% increase in the number of transactions might occur, especially for people that have been waiting. Um, in traveling around the state to talk to people from different counties, uh, there were several business owners that told us directly, I'm just waiting for three years to build, one of them was a piece of rental housing property that they're just waiting for three years to develop so they can sell it at the end of the six years to someone to manage that rental housing property that's needed in that town. So it's just causing them to wait. So, so well, what that could, goes to well, what could Michael's make an first. exemption for that? Yeah, we could make it shorten up the time frame. Again, if we if we made exemptions, it would further complicate and raise the administrative costs. And if we exempt the type of behavior that we want to incentivize, then we're we're likely to not receive any tax revenue from this. Yeah, and I'm just struggling. Yeah, I, I don't mind that we don't receive tax revenue. Uh, but I do mind that, I mean, I guess I'm just not sure I see the, the harm in leaving it on the books, even if it doesn't generate any tax revenue, because it could have a prophylactic effect on right. people doing bad things that it was originally designed to stop. You're saying that they don't exist anymore, and you have, and you have zone, local zoning taking care of it, but what's the harm to having another uh, protection. Disincentive and protection. The harm would be um, right now, uh, taxpayers that are buying and selling properties pay somewhere between five hundred thousand and a million dollars of preparation fees because of this tax, and that's for them to transmit one point seven mi five million to us, and that's based on conversations with attorneys who immediately add at least two hundred dollars to a transaction involving land gains. Yeah, but you, but you said that with the exemptions we were talking about. They're a hundred percent of your of the filings, right. so they wouldn't even have to. But file to claim it. an exemption, you still have to prepare the return and demonstrate the exemption. So there are things we can administratively do, and we actually held a lean event, a continuous improvement event, two weeks ago. In in the event that the legislation is not successful, it's our preference to to repeal, and we think that would provide the most benefit to um, to Vermonters. In the event that that's not desirable, we are preparing ways to streamline it administratively as well as statutory suggestions. Okay. What I'm hearing is this is a real pain to administer, first of all, uh, that it raises very little money in the grand scheme of things, that it's not really necessary because the conditions that put it in effect in the first place are no longer present, and it does have a real cost to Vermonters. If it costs Vermonters 500000 or more, in terms of preparation fees, that's costing the economy money to produce virtually no revenue. It makes no sense to keep something like that on the books. That is <laughs> our suggestion, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Much better than me, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Except the one thing that's left out of that argument, and I think it has to be yeah. debated, is there may be actions that are being prevented right now that exactly. we don't know about that when you repeal the tax, they may start coming forward. Now, well, that, I guess that, you that, can, can think through what those actions, what those things might be. I mean, we always face, in anything we do, the law of unintended consequences. But generally speaking, when that happens, it costs people money rather than otherwise around. And we I, know well, right now okay, we've so, got something that we can see in front of us so, in terms of cost. So we're going to deal with this more probably yeah. in finance. That, 
the connection here was more towards, I do want to see this go away to the extent it's preventing renovations of property. So mm -hmm. that's where I was coming from in this committee. You know, and, I, and I'm not unsympathetic to the, the thing that caught my attention is that you're saying the municipal zoning and all of this other stuff has served as a, a replacement for things coming forward. And we don't need this tax. We, should, we also have that kind of, that protection. So that's what I would like to hear more about. I'm sure we'll deal with it in finance. But those are the balancing. It's an interesting discussion. And I think the overlay also, just to interconnect everything in this committee, is that the short-term rental market is, is, at least in my community, exacerbating the, the, the bot purchasing properties that are considered affordable, renovating them and then, and then reselling them. Uh, that has happened a bit too. And um, I, I act, I, I'm much more supportive of trying to keep, make it a more effective disincentive, adding more enforcement or, or actually using all of your wonderful investigators to actually see how big the, you know, if there, if there is an enforcement problem or, you know, I know you looked at some of that, but I'd rather shorten the time frame and or exempt designated downtowns and village centers rather than get rid of what I think is a disincentive to flipping but and fragmentation. So yeah, I, and I think we're not there yet in terms of getting all yeah. the information. You know, we're just having a half a half hour conversation and to come to the I, I may be leaning that way, but I certainly haven't come to a decision yet. And we're gonna have Doug back in next week on short term rentals and that is a concern that we're hearing nationwide. I don't know how it, it applies to land gain tax, but that affordable housing is, is we're losing housing to these short-term rentals, and I don't know if the land gain tax comes involved in that in any way. But thank you. That was more than I actually thought. Was Can I, I just need to put one thing on the record. Absolutely. Uh, related to S67, the controlling interest, um, He's backing off. <laughs> I, I can't promise administrative support at this time. I, I did say and I do believe uh, that it makes good sense from a we policy tra perspective. We, tra we trapped you. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you. getting out of the trap. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. The Brocks are up in connection. Boy, <laughs> <heavy trouble. laughs> I was just in the chair for Okay. Um, so we're going to move on to NEPSI and the Vermont training program. And I thought it would be useful to get sort of an update how those programs are faring. And, you know, um, and then we still have to supply another member of the committee to that, to the NEPSI board, right? Yes. Yes. Thomas last time. Jane, Gina Sullivan is desperate for I'm going to cover Dutchie first. I okay. asked Brandon to join. And I'm sorry that you didn't get sorry. specific notice, so if you don't have any handouts, that's fine. Well, maybe what we'll do is go over the veggie proposed changes okay. for this. That's a good um, idea. And that, I think, was sent. It was in the original packet. There's a description in the white paper, and there's also some proposed language. Okay, well, give us a, a minute to find Sure. It. So it's in the white papers? There's a white paper that'll describe the changes, and there's also proposed language. Uh, if not, I could just send this to Kim. And, and it's under, here it is, it's called it's Growing, growing the, economy. the Economy. It's not the same one. language as we rejected last year, is it? Uh, similar. <laughs> <laughs> similar, but hey, enhanced. It's called Try, Try, Try Again. <laughs> here, it, here it is. It's the number two clip thing in your packets. Modernize the Vermont Employment Growth Center. Got it. Does everybody have it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is what we modernize is a word that we've used also. Yes, it is. It's very modern. It's to acknowledge the, the changes in the business community. Yeah. Here. Oh, they do? They do? Just as 
should we do an overview first of Reggie? Okay, let's please, do that, please, okay? Please. And um, I'll let Megan take that away. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad um, you're here. My name is Megan Sullivan. I am the um, five-month-in new <laughs> uh, executive director of um, BEPSI, um, the Vermont Economic Progress Council. Sorry, I'm not going to speak in acronyms. Um, so I've been uh, with BEPSI now for five months. Prior to this, I was business liaison in Congressman Peter Welch's office for about seven years. Um, and before that, was working in economic development. With the, with the state. So I have um, a career of, of working in economic development in Vermont and um, appreciate um, the challenges and the opportunities that, that exist um, and I'm excited to be participating with VEPSI and with the Agency of Commerce in the state of Vermont um, to try and address some of the challenges um, as well as um, enhance some of the opportunities that are, are here for us. Um, so the Vermont Economic Progress Council was created by the General Assembly um, 25 years ago. They just celebrated their, their 25th anniversary. Um, and administrative um, support is um, held through ACCD. Um, and that is through, um, I'm in an appointed position, the executive director is appointed position, and there's one other employee um, who is a classified position with the department who's a grants program manager. Um, that's um, Abby Sherman, who has previously 11 years experience as assistant town manager in Bethel, Vermont, so brings an incredible wealth of knowledge um, to our team, and especially with our, with our TIP districts. Um, so there are nine um, council members who are um, appointed by the governor who are regional representatives um, to the VEPSI board. And then there is a member from the House um, and a position for a member from the Senate. We'd love to, to have as soon as possible. It's been vacant <laughs> for two years. Now, do you, now just to be clear, even though we're on the record, is it vacant or is one of our senators just not showing up? No, it is vacant. It's so vacant because Kevin, Kevin, Kevin was in it. Senator so Mullen Kevin's had previously. Where, where did I hear Senator Sears now? It, with on, workforce, that's development. That's workforce development. Oh, different one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we need one there too. Right? So that position is appointed by the committee on committees, from my understanding. Yep. Yes. Um, I'd be happy to provide information on what the duties of a council member are and what our meeting schedule is. So as folks might be looking at um, what the opportunities are to, to fill that role. If any of that background information would be helpful, I'm happy to, okay. to provide it to um, the committee or, or to members. Okay, well after, after this discussion, we'll make a volunteer visit. Okay. Um, so VEPSI administers two programs, the Vermont Employment Growth Incentive, uh, known as VEGI, as well as the Tax Increment Financing Program, known as um, TIF. So I think for today we're focusing on Veggie. Um, Veggie was created um, out of a former incentive program, um, the EATI program, and I'm not sure what that yeah, is for anymore. Ask you, but it's been, um, Veggie's been in place since 2007. Um, so it's been a little over 10 years that we've had to, to see how the program works. Um, and it's an incentive to encourage business recruitment, growth, and expansion in Vermont uh, that is beyond organic growth of the business that's expected. So looking at an industry, what is the expected growth? So beyond that, and that wouldn't have otherwise occurred in Vermont. Which is, the famous but which is the famous but for. Famous but for. <laughs> um, it's a performance-based incentive. So it's not used for financing, it's not a grant, it has to be earned um, based on targets that are set by the participant. Um, so to be eligible to participate, um, the proposed economic activity, which would be in the form of jobs, new jobs to Vermont, um, in the form of um, payroll, so new jobs that meet a certain um, wage threshold, which I'll talk about, and capital expenditures. So that's, we're building a building, we're buying machinery, um, looking at what is the benefit to the state from that. So the, the benefit to the state 
has to exceed the cost to the state um, for potential growth. And that is determined through a economic model, REMI model, um, that was developed, this model using REMI, developed by Jeff Carr um, when uh, this program was created. Um, these types of growth opportunities are run through the model to say, what is the benefit to the state, as well as what is the cost to the state. So if you're adding, adding jobs, um, there's going to be more kids in the school. There's going to be more wear on our roads. So looking at that as a, as a piece of this. Um, so the model takes that into account. As long as the benefit to the state is greater than the cost, and this is before any enhancements are considered, which we'll talk about, um, they've met that first criteria. How is this rehab? Just yeah. All the, those benefits to the yeah. state. The uh, second is that the municipality welcomes the business. Um, so we're not going to incentivize a business to, to grow or to come to Vermont if the municipality says we want nothing to do with this. So we require um, a letter from the municipality saying yes, this, this, um, we welcome the business. It has to conform with regional plans, and this will work with regional development corporations and the regional planning commissions to make sure that this is part of what that region wants as well. Um, it's not in a limited local market, so it's not giving an unfair advantage to one business over another. So if you've got widget A maker on this side of the road and widget B maker on this side of the road, we're not going to incentivize widget A maker to grow if it's going to harm um, another Vermont business. So that's what debt is an eligibility criteria. Um, and then the but for. So the but for um, is this would not occur without the incentive, or it would incur, occur in a significantly different manner with a significantly less desirable outcome to the state. So um, that could be someone who might do a partial expansion in Vermont, but it's going to do a full expansion elsewhere. It could mean they're going to grow a few jobs, but with an incentive, they could really add more because they'd be able to, throughout the years, um, reduce other costs. Um, or it could be that we're full stop, we might come to Vermont, but we're also being worked by these other states. So we need to know what that would look like. Have you, I assume you've seen the auditor's report on this? Uh, so the auditor's report or the, I've seen both. Yeah, the auditor's report, report this yeah. year. Yes. Okay. So in the auditor's report, there's a real indictment, not necessarily of FC, but nationwide of the of but for tests. And so could you explain a little bit more how you have confidence in the but for test? Sure. So I think Vermont, um, this body when creating the statute really looked at that piece of what is our but for statement. Um, and, and that's critical because there isn't an appropriation for veggie um, because this is based on the idea that this is new revenue to the state. Um, and some states that do have a but for clause, they just say, okay, we need a statement that says but for this, we wouldn't uh, do that. That requires backup documentation. So um, so you've, you've made this statement saying but for this incentive, we wouldn't um, grow here or we've grown significantly in a different manner. On top of that, we want to say, well, what if what if those other conversations that you've had been? We need to see documentation that you really have looked elsewhere. We want to see the financials of what it would look like if you were to grow smaller, and what it would look like here. So we do require uh, additional information, and I can I can provide the committee with sort of our, our sheet that we provide applicants, which is three pages long of here's how the but for is considered. So. There's an initial conversation with staff um, when someone is looking at this incentive where we might see a lot of drop off because folks are saying, really excited to grow in Vermont, I'm gonna add these jobs, what can you do for me? It's like, well, it sounds like you're already gonna do this. It doesn't matter what we're gonna do for you, you're gonna do it anyways. Um, so some folks are out at that stage and we're working on really tracking that um, moving forward. I was going to ask you, do you have any we documentation do. of denying claims based upon the but-for test? So 
we have some, how they we've, had, we've had some staff turnover, so it's not complete. I think um, that's certainly a goal of mine is to, to look at that and, and to really quantify, <clears throat> especially because in that inquiry stage, we don't have any, they haven't filled out a formal application. Um, yeah, so I just want to interject, like sometimes like, this all gets kind of referred through the RDC network, right? So then the business talks to the RDC and they describe veggie and then they're like, forget it. You know, they may hear about it and they're like, I'm not going to go for it. We're not tracking how many of those are saying no right at the get-go. Or others who go through the preliminary veggie and find out that the, the, the dollar amount that they could possibly go for is so small mm -hmm. that they couldn't possibly make a case that but for this they would go right. on. We will going forward track that a little We're bit better because what it looks like is that the people who go through veggie actually end up getting it because it is such an onerous process. There is a smaller subset that that goes through it. And we has had been, has seven. There, has there ever been a, someone who's gone through the whole process and been denied? There have been folks yeah. who are denied. Now you know. So there's the council's going to review criteria, and there are folks who are coming in and saying that this is, um, I mean, those obvious but fours are, should be, not get to the point of there being, reviewed by they've, the they've done the entire application before we say, well, wait a minute. But there are some cases where folks have said, we're going to grow exponentially this amount. Um, and they file their initial application and, and they're approved. And then between the initial application and the final application, when they've had the opportunity to say, okay, we're going to start our project, and then they say, well, actually, we're not going to grow like that. We've had, that's where we've had folks be denied, where they've revised those numbers down to the point where they say, you know what, this is no longer but for, you don't need this incentive to grow those amount um, of jobs anymore. So we've had um, instances where that's happened. Um, I think we, we had 13 initial applications go through the program last year, or 13 initial applications be approved last year, seven approved as final, and some folks deferred until this year. Um, there are 21,000 businesses in Vermont. So there are plenty of businesses who are growing without veggie. The threshold to participate in veggie is high. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at that number of, of the statistics that, that were provided on that only a certain percentage can meet the but for, we're only incentivizing a very small percentage of, of Vermont business growth. So, you know, I, I'm do happy have, to continue we, to look at that do data. Have, do we have programs in Vermont that are analogous in any way to veggie for small businesses? Because the complaint I keep hearing is that yeah. the veggie process you got to be pretty sophisticated. You got to be pretty big. You got to have the capacity on your staff to, yep. to right. do it, to apply. So, so part of what our, we're um, we're offering here as as a proposal for modernizing is is to have an enhancement for small business to make this a little more say, worth it, and this would match our green veggie enhancement. Right. Um, That's and, under the fly. And I, I think part of, so part of this is going to be um, a legislative fix. Um, part of it is a, also an, an image that, that we do have a high percentage of, of businesses who aren't large who are applying and participating in the program. Um, I think 22% of our participants, or 22 of our 124 that have gone through the program so far have been under 20 employees. Can you say that one more time? Yeah, sorry. So we've had 124 businesses who have participated in the program okay. um, in, in the 10 years. years. Thank you. So, and it's a nine-year program. Okay. So it takes a long time to complete. Um, and of those 124 businesses, 22 had under 20 employees at the time of application. What do you mean by it's a nine-year program? So <laughs> we're incentivizing growth right. and businesses are saying here's what our projection is right. up to five years right that is paid out each year over the course of five years right. so a business would create their target one jobs right. and payroll and capital expenditures and would have to create that and then maintain that for five years to get that those five installments for that first year right. year two 
on top of year one, they have to create and maintain the, those jobs for year two and year one. That gets paid out over five years. So by the fifth year of targets, that fifth year will get paid out year five and then the next four years. So someone who applied. But is that just after the fifth year, is that just ministerial? They're entitled to it at that point. It's just a question when they get their no. money. Or if they do continue? not maintain those jobs, they will not get okay. paid out. So they, it is a, uh, it is administratively intensive to fill well, this paperwork. You mentioned account. administratively intensive. I remember talking with a company that is in the veggie program, and one of their comments was that it is more difficult to fill out the annual reporting for veggie than it is to do their income taxes. Oh. And is we, that we, your experience? We've talked with the tax department um, about that. So, so VEPC has the role of um, authorizing participation. to make their rules more difficult? They have, they have <laughs> talked to us about how we can streamline it. So this is a this is a program, Veggie is a real partnership between VEPC and with um, the tax department. Standing up right <laughs> It's a real partnership because we authorize and then um, the tax department has state employee of the year, one employee who individually reviews all of the claims that come in against a company's W-2s. Um, and it is intensive, um, and he is um, an incredibly hard worker, um, and has been a great partner as I've, as I've um, come up to speed here. Um, but they, there is some ideas on how we can streamline this process to make it more integrated with what a company is already providing. So. May I ask a question? Please. So, Megan, yes. uh, how many uh, new, how many, I don't remember how to ask this, but how many jobs have we incented through this program and what is the economic impact that you would say those jobs have had? Is that here? I, I think can't that should find be it. on your infographic. Oh, is it on the infographic? Or on our annual report. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't have the annual report, so my infographic is buried. Big surprise. No, it's okay. I've got it. It's here. It's just a question of finding it. So what is so, it? Because you know, it's been we now in our eleventh year. Yeah. We. I just love to know how many jobs we've created as a result of this, and what the cost per job has been to create, and how. Yeah. Back. Where? Sorry. Where are we? Here and we are. This, the Got infographic it. may have this year's information on it and projected for the current um, employees. I. Um, it does. I can get so that. I, I just we think can get we'd appreciate seeing that. Yeah, we have that. Um, I, I just I wasn't. Know you do. That's why I'm prepared to come today. So, but I can get, um, I can get, all that. and I, our annual report, our annual report um, should have that. And we have done um, a lot of work to get our annual report back to what is required in the annual report, so that it was a little bit more um, readable. So I'm just. Uh, I'll just. Uh, oh, good. You're pulling it off. Stay. I pulled it up, and so you're going to pull. Thank you new qualifying jobs. This is from the inception of it to December 31st, 2016, because there is a lag. The new qualifying jobs created was 6,216. And the new jobs, both direct and indirect, were 8,855. Uh, new payroll created 368 million and change. I'll just round up the average wage of 59,000. Um, qualifying capital investments, 829 million, and the net revenue benefit to the state is 38 million 866. And what would? Yeah. So we have data through 2016 finalized because it is submitted through a claim to the tax department, and then um, we get those finalized numbers when that full year has been reviewed. So right now we have through 2016, and then we'll be getting through 2017 um, when the 2017 claims have all been reviewed. 
John. Well, the 368 million was the oh. economic impact with the, I can't remember what that was. New jobs, added associated jobs, average income. 368 was the new qualifying payroll created. Qualifying meaning it has to meet that minimum wage threshold. Right. Um, many of these create economic activity, even if they're not getting yeah. a veggie payment due. Thank you. So, do you want to go through the changes, or do you want more no, background? Or? No, that sounds good. Let's go Great. through the changes. And it, that's attached, right? The new language. Yeah. So, um, in addition to the standard veggie incentive, there are um, a few enhancements that currently exist. Um, I think the first few years of going through this program, there was a realization that there was a high concentration in um, our high growth areas. And um, that meant that we weren't incentivizing um, growth in the rest of the state. So how do we do that? And that's where the um, LMA enhancement was created to say, you know, if you're, if you're growing in a Department of Labor identified LMA, we're going to enhance your veggie award for up to 100% um, of, of benefit. Um, and the wage threshold is lower. So instead of 160% of minimum wage, it's 140% of minimum wage. To understand that, that in our economically disadvantaged areas, Right, which we did a few years ago. Right, so, um, so that exists currently as well as a green veggie enhancement, and this is an enhancement to grow jobs um, in, in the green industry. So um, that go, can go up to 90%, um, and then it brings the background growth rate. So that is looking at what is expected in the industry, um, and that looks at background growth rate at a 20% level. And we're, we're saying that, that, that these are important jobs and how do we incentivize businesses who might want to grow in that area to do so in Vermont because these are the types um, Where of businesses. is that? So that's section. current. That's in place. Current. No, but you're suggesting even going further down? Yeah, on? clean water and incentivizing so all it, sorts of small business and water. No, no, that wasn't my point. I was talking about the percentage of the minimum wage. Yeah. You said you were... So that's... So currently, it's... Cur the way that... Um, the wage threshold is currently determined is based on minimum wage. It's 160 percent um, outside of the LMA, so in um, Chinda County, Washington, or it's Washington County, um, some other areas in the state, and I can get you that list. Um, so the current wage threshold in those areas is $17.25 an hour, and that doesn't include benefits. So benefits, we require free benefits in addition to that wage requirement. Okay. Um, in, in LMA, it's 140%, which is $15.09 an hour. Um, I think... But you're suggesting changing that. Right. So, I'm just asking looking where at a potential for... Where oh, where is it? It's, uh, I think it's right at... Right at I think it's right at the top. Um, There's page numbers here. The page. Are, are you in the bill itself, the yes. draft language? Yes. It's on this Thursday. So under 3331 definitions, wage threshold, that's where we put in the changes. Um, oh, that's skipping around here. So 1725 hourly. 3331? It's, uh, it must be. I don't have that section in my book. I don't have it. I have pages 1 through 12 of edgy modernization draft language. And three, it goes three, from 3330 three, three, to 3333. Three, three. Right. So maybe we don't have the latest version huh. of this. Okay. Uh, I could, um, is it called something? Because the title. It's just called Veggie Modernization Draft Language. Right, but yeah. the, the salary yeah. enhancement is. You have small business. Oh, I see it. It's, it's, in see it? it's at the. Page 11, I think. Yeah, it's, it must be fairly further on. It's in 3335, according to this. Older. Yeah. What's the date on it? Oh, yeah, this is the older. This isn't the most recent. Okay. So here it is on page 11 and 12. Yeah, I, like I see this on page 25. It is a Okay. And right. the definition, you're right, says 3333. So we, we wouldn't want to 
disrupt what is currently required, but we also want to acknowledge that um, at a $15 an hour minimum wage, the wage threshold for veggie would be $24 an hour or $21 an hour in an LMA. Um, so, and if our goal is to have this work in rural areas and have small businesses participate, um, that can be a real barrier. Now, as we're incentivizing jobs, jobs with higher wages are incentivized more. So it's not saying that we're going to incentivize a job that's paying $17, $25 an hour the same way we would incentivize a job that's paying $24 an hour, but we're also not going to create a barrier to entry. So just, I mean, we don't have to sure. dwell on this right now. This will obviously be a controversy, but is, is are you making this change contingent upon us passing a $15 minimum wage? You mentioned a $15 minimum wage. Um, I don't. I think that was the impetus, but I also we wanted to reach some sort of corresponding um, to the Vermont training program. We currently peg that to the uh, JFO livable wage. Mm -hmm. right. So we thought, why not we have the same here, uh, except that we put the 17 in so that we weren't going lower than what uh, some of the current uh, recipients are are having to target. Okay, so all I was just saying is that part of the original thinking to do this was in anticipation of an increase in the minimum wage. I would hope that we would pass the minimum wage before we implement it. Before so we pick, pick things. On the other hand, so we like appreciate the administration's support of raising the minimum wage. wage and pegging new things to it. I think what I'm saying <laughs> is that we want to make sure Maggie like continues to work for small businesses and for businesses in our rural area. Acknowledging that the incentive doesn't work, this you know isn't going to provide the same level of incentive for um, a Low job wage. at um, you know if it's JFO's livable wage that it's, it's that wage won't incentivize the same way as a, as a higher one does. But that that people don't see that as a factor of, well, I'm not going to. So, so why do we have a specific dollar amount anyway? I thought it was much better just having it be a percent. So if it's a hundred, if, if one program is 160% of minimum wage, it just floats with whatever the minimum wage is. I think we have a dollar in here because that's what the current, the current threshold the is. So we don't want to say we're going to move to, to live a wage today and have that I, I, drops down yeah. to what? Right, but it doesn't. It, what I guess what I'm trying to say is, whenever you say a percent above the minimum wage, it'll always float with the, whatever the minimum wage is, no matter what we add. You we just don't. Will. You have we a threshold would. you don't want it to be below. We would I just disqualify so many. We would disqualify so many. You'd have to pay how much? Twenty. Twenty-four dollars an hour. I think, I think Senator Fawcett raises a really good point. I mean, this, my understanding of both the Vermont Training Program and this is, this is the wage is yet another element of trying to produce other social policies. If we're giving out money to help businesses, we want them to be poster childs for a good policy, whether we do it for B corporations or whether we do it in certain locations and set preferences. We don't want to race to the bottom on the right. wage as an incentive for people to get this money. So uh, well, to, I think to, leave, to leave a fixed number to stagnate in there while the rest of the economy yeah, is Yeah, bag that idea. Let's no, but uh, it, it would actually track the livable wage. We just put that dollar amount in there to handle this in between time of people who are currently in the program. Okay. You know, that, that's okay. the reason why it's there, but it really would track to livable wage, which we would assume would get adjusted accordingly. But we're not, sadly, I wish we were, we're contemplating a new minimum wage, but it's not yet a livable wage. I mean, for 2024. And as we know, there's a discussion between basic needs mm -hmm. and livable wage. So let's keep going Proceed. on the language. Any other? Sure. So we've added um, a few enhancements. We talked about small business um, enhancement, which would um, incentivize Add the enhancement for businesses that are at the time of application have zero to 19 employees. Um, and and what, is, what is the enhancement? A greater, a greater 
grant? Yes. And how does that, what, when, is it specified what the extra enhancement is? Is it double yeah. or what, what is it? No, so it, it calculates at 90% instead of 80%. So the, okay. the current right. regular veggie calculates at 80%. 80%. So this would be at 90% okay. and it would be at 20% of background growth rate. So taking out some of that background growth rate. And I think part of that is, you know, when you're looking at background growth rate, which is determined by NAICS code, um, Vermont's business size, what we consider a small business, is not what you know, others may consider a small business. Or the rest under. of the world. <laughs> so, you know, our, do our small businesses grow at the rate that a larger business is growing at that rate? And, and so in the same way that we did with Green Veggie, saying that this business sector, this small business is really where Vermont thrives, and this is where where our growth comes from. So bringing that background growth rate down in the way that we do with green veggie. Um, I, I, I think I know enough about, about how this program works to, to be dangerous. But <laughs> well, you're that on this <laughs> It's very difficult to visualize this in practical terms. And again, on that one page, it would be great to see an infographic that takes one or two specific examples to show what do they have to commit to, what do they have to deliver, and what do they get when they do, and when. Sure. So that we can see this, in effect, in a real life example. I know I'm not. She has a sort of So when I can send that to Kyle. Oh, that's a great one. So this that. is how mm -hmm. it, this is a sample of somebody's mm -hmm. pace payout. Um, over the nine years, so saying, you know, what's being created, what is the background growth rate, what's the benefit to the state, um, and what's the total incentive. Now there's the maximum incentive, so we're going to create all of our jobs January 1st of the year, the state is going to get the maximum benefit for the full year, or more likely second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. And then how is that paid out over the, the life of um, the incentive. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously very small. <laughs> we can provide you. Yeah, the but it gives the, <laughs> it gives the um, the picture of what is what is a business looking at for their incentive and how how will that be earned over time? And they have to meet the target. Like they have to meet the number of jobs, the dollar value payroll, and the capex before they even get that little fractional. So I'm trying to, to, to be able to see an example that just will give me a sense by looking at something practical of right. what's the return on investment to the state for doing this. Yeah. Yes. this and how, how can we see it visually, uh, uh, whether through figures or, yeah. or infographic or whatever, that will tell us that in a way that we can understand it. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think it is a very complicated program. So we want to be able to provide information that gets you what you need without, um, and I think this is where we, we have um, some trouble is when it's reported in the media that jobs are created and then they're paid this money and then the jobs leave. It's much more complicated than that. Um, so to, we want to provide you the information without losing some of the critical details on how that's done. Um, so I can get you a few pieces that I have now, and if, yeah, um, I mean, I don't, that sort of talks about the process that we're trying to, to help visualize what the process a company goes through is and, and what goes into the determinations that are made. So we can provide you what we have and then work on you know, how do we provide more with what you need for that. Um, so the, the enhanced uh, veggie for the small business was to meet exactly that critique that we had heard, you know, that it's, it's too difficult for small business, they don't have a CFO to do all this reporting. And this would be an attempt to make the enhancement much more worth the time and the effort expended. Um, that same enhancement would go for mission-based businesses, what else? Yeah, so mission-based. 
So they would have to be registered as an L3C or a benefit corporation. So these are corporations that in their business model have a triple bottom line. And we are not only looking at growing our profit, but we're looking at how are we supporting our employees and how are we supporting our community. Vermont was the first state to create the L3C um, Remind us what L3C is. I mean, I know what benefit corporations are, but L3Cs I've forgotten. But the actual low, a low life, low profit, no. or something like it's that. It's a low, low, low profit. profit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's uh, a. You just own one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like the full name. It was just low profit. Yes. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it stands for. I think it's low liability limited. Low, low there. Low liability limited partnership. Low liability. Vermont was the second state to have a benefit corporation um, registration option. Um, and since then, and other states have- And how many do we have now? The most per capita. But other states yeah. have followed suit. So yeah. we're well, no longer okay. um, leading yeah. the efforts to recruit these businesses. This enhancement would be the first of its kind. Um, and I think it could be a really advantageous way for us to continue to grow um, this type of business. And I think by doing this as an enhancement, we're not picking winners and losers in the economy, um, but saying that, that this is part of who Vermont is, and this is who we who were, you know, um, would give an enhancement to. Um, part of um, what we hear from small businesses, too, is nine-year payout is Tough. I mean, that's. I need capital earlier um, to be able to do what I need to do to make the business successful. Um, so one in change we have it in here is a option for a business to say instead of for each year getting paid out over five years, we're going to get them a lump sum for that year's goals if they're met year one, and there would be a stronger recapture than there currently is for folks who take that over a five-year installment period because they'll still be required to report on their maintenance of those, um, but um, they'll get that in the, in the year one and then in year two and year three and year four and year five. Uh, and this, in part, was to recognize that there was a program created, VETI, which is the Veggie Enhanced Training Initiative, so an acronym within the acronym is always it's really a little bit of a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> and it was created with great intentions of saying that you know small businesses, startup businesses have intense training needs at the beginning of their um, life cycle that it's that's harder for them to finance than maybe folks who have um, a longer um, history. So can we front load some of their incentive to help cover some of their training provided in the Vermont training program? So it was a great, a great idea, um, but it hasn't. So run it's not great in practice. Okay. Not, but so it's funded through the training. Yeah. Through the it's, training. Oh, the training it's funded program. through the training. That's program, why John is still here. Yes. Okay. And but it's, <laughs> but yeah. so explain to me how it's nested under. So if veggie, someone is I'm participating confused. in Veggie, so they would say, to be so that, well, they'd be signing up and they yep. check a box saying we want to participate in Veggie, the Vermont, the Veggie Enhanced mm -hmm. Training Initiative, and then would say, would go to John, or I would let John know that this company has signed up for Veggie. Yeah. So what does Veggie stand for? Again? The Vermont. Veggie. Yeah. Enhanced Training Initiative, or oh, that with that with a T. That T, yeah. So, for those companies participating, instead of paying up to fifty percent of the wages, the training program would cover up to seventy-five percent of the wages. And in theory, that extra twenty-five percent would come out of well, they the their incentive. incentive. The incentive. So it's front-loading their ability to do the training. The statute has some language that has made that difficult to administer because in places it says pay 25% back to the training program because the training program is we can pay that, but also pay 25% to 
back to the business. So it's not clear as it stands now. Um, I think another issue is if the training program is on a rolling basis that you're paying out um, after folks have done training, veggie is done based on the, the tax calendar year. If you have hired nine people and your target was 10 people, you may have already gotten that 75% for your training, but you're not going to get paid. You'll be in claim veggie. delay with veggie because you didn't meet your target. So what does that mean? Like it puts the training program at risk of those employers never earning their budget. So, so we to yeah. avoid that, um, to still get to the same result of saying we understand that, that um, businesses may need this sooner, mm -hmm. um, have that as an option for veggie participants to say you can choose to get the lump sum for your year one goals in year one, um, and if you don't maintain, then we're going to recapture that lump sum, as opposed to we just won't pay you your next installment. Um, get rid of that e altogether. Uh, if I could add to that from the training program, there's John just identified. Oh, I'm sorry, John Young, director of the Vermont Training Program. There's, there's nothing that does not allow the training program to run concurrently with their veggie application as is. So, so there's nothing to say that we potentially couldn't help out with up to 50% of the wages during their, you know, their, their first year of veggie either or whatever year that they're choosing the training program. So, so the, 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 the incentive from the training program is still going to be there just not that extra 25%. Is the is that the only training program or veggie related training program that's on the table at this point? That change or do yeah, yeah, that would involve that is, Do you have any changes just for the one training program? I do not. Are you you think we're it's a good stopping point for I wanted to make sure we covered one more thing which was the LMA cap. Okay. We currently have it capped at a million, and we're just wondering why that is. Like, is there a need to have a cap when there's an overall cap of 10 million? And the idea would be, don't we want to encourage growth in those areas that have higher unemployment than the rest of the state? Are we coming close to the million dollar cap now? Yes, very, like oh, oh. uncomfortably close. Um, like one company backed out at the end of last year, and that made us okay, otherwise we're going to have to do a whole joint fiscal committee to come and raise the, the cap. And at and the same time, you're not coming close to the overall cap. No, like we're midway, right? We're Five million no. about, like midway between the uh, year usage and the 10 million for the year. That sounds like a reasonable point. But yeah. how interesting that it is actually in such high demand yes. in the areas we've targeted, which work. maybe we should be shifting the whatever's left elsewhere. Well, that's what the raising the cap. Yeah, the cap. yeah, eliminate the cap, and then we have no. So can we hear about the Vermont training program in the last 10 minutes? Is that OK, uh, Commissioner? Yeah, I think that's great. OK, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Megan, and welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Good job. <laughs> and do you, I still work with my dear friend, Sarah Callahan. How's she doing? I haven't talked to her since she moved. She's poised on taking some job with some senator in Maryland, but I have no idea what she's actually chosen. She was my favorite babysitter, so. <laughs> uh, I met her when she was three months old. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Young, and I direct the Vermont Training Program. I'm a classified uh, employee with the state of Vermont been a state employee for about 14 and a half years, three and a half of which is with the training program, and a past uh, layoff of uh, IBM in, in Essex. I was an ah. technician there that chose to stay in the state. So. Did you live in Essex? I live in Jericho. Okay. Their loss, our game. <laughs> there you go. That's a hopefully. Right. So um, I'm not sure if folks are familiar with the Vermont training program, but it's a workforce development grant program um, that the state uh, basically partners with employers to 
to upskill uh, their employees. So they're to be an employee, can be an incumbent employee, can be a new employee, but there has to be um, a, you know, a contract of employment there with that. So um, our, we, uh, in our statutory language, uh, there was some uh, suggestion of free employment. That's always a dicey area for us to get into, so we somewhat try to stay away from that. That's just um, not what DOL does. DOL certainly does a lot of pre-employment work, so, um, but I think that's been in that language for quite some time. Uh, in my three and a half years, we've never um, funded any pre-employment stuff that always been. Yeah, the only, yeah. the only caveat on that is just the carve-out that you did a couple of years ago. We carved out a portion of the training program to help pay for uh, talent pipeline development activities, like things where schools are developing more based learning programs and they need uh, the employer is helping them and the employer is spending time on it. On so a one-time basis or is it ongoing? We have that ongoing. I think it's 10%. 10%. It's ongoing. It's it's not as subscribed to as, as we thought it was initially. 10% um, of what? Of the yearly allocation. Which is? Uh, $1.2 million. So uh, roughly $120,000. And we've never hit that cap of $120,000. You have? I have not. Yeah, not in a year's time. Well, wait, wait. So is that is this sort of like a grant program? People come to you and ask you for some money? I'll so, I know yeah. my time is short it's here, but I can certainly explain uh, okay, at I'm another sorry. time in, in much more detail of, of how that works as well as the, the regular training program. Well, let's, let's focus on the regular training program. Yeah. So, I, do you have questions? Or, uh, <laughs> we always have. I know. <laughs> Don't ask that. Okay. We're restraining <laughs> ourselves. So, uh, I'm proud course. to say that I have a, a mighty staff of 0.5. So there's 1.5 of us. I visit between 150 and 200 employers a year uh, around the state of Vermont. And I travel between 35,000 and 40,000 miles a year uh, around the state. But that's so, even more than us on our campaign. Yeah, right. So I, you know, I feel fortunate because I get to sit in, uh, in, in manufacturing facilities and healthcare and you know, a number of uh, sectors to talk about the pain points for a lot of the employers and to, to hopefully um, help them sort of figure out what their uh, future needs are. And you would be amazed at, um, you know, we talk about the fears of high taxes for employers and, you know, Vermont's not always the friendliest. I, I believe workforce worries and concerns are even surpassed the other worries mm -hmm. that they have currently. Um, succession planning just isn't there. I, I would say as a state employee of 14 and a half years, succession planning isn't with state employees either. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a scary proposition. <laughs> Currently we have um, 65 grants um, open in application. An employer can have a grant um, that will, can run. As Megan said earlier, we're, we're on a rolling basis. So if somebody gets a grant approved and January 5th of 2019, that grant activity can run into January 5th of 2020. So um, we also have five current um, uh, active applications that uh, we work with sometimes on a daily basis. So I call myself more of a head juggler because uh, if you can imagine, we have grants exiting and entering at, at, all, at all times. So. What's the range of the grants? Uh, this is going to be anecdotal. Uh, it's in my report, but I think our probably lowest the last fiscal year was about three thousand um, dollars, and I think our largest was two seventy, two hundred seventy some odd thousand dollars. So, um, and you they can repeat, right? I mean, a company can have more than one grant. Potentially, uh, so that was certainly a critique of the auditor, right, yes. uh, a couple of years back, and you know, we've uh, provided information to him on who has been a repeater. Um, so I think within the last three years, we've only had one or two grants that were um, repeated by employers, and we're really looking for something that's extraordinary. One of these grants, they doubled their staff. Um, in that period of time. So oh my gosh. I believe our feelings were with something like that, shame on the state if they're not willing to uh, participate and help them out if possible, if there is uh, a really rapid growth. And in, this, in this particular uh, job, they were all forty to $50,000 position. That's um, great. Which was wonderful. So very rarely do we see a back-to-back -back grant from a business 
We may see back-to-back -back grants, though, in a year, uh, within a year, or even multiple years from a training provider, right, who's, who's offering training to a multiple of companies, right? Like uh, FEMA? Jerry. Oh, high tech, or or how? Potentially. Okay. So we're gonna have to go up in a couple of minutes. You hear the bells ring. Yeah. So you pick what you want to tell us. Oh, sure. Um, you know, I, I think again, uh, there's there's more. Uh, I'm seeing probably in the last two years more pressure on employers, sort of screaming for help. Um, we we do not recruit employers for the Vermont training program. Um, we hear from our regional development partners. A lot of them will reach out and talk with us. Um, and so I think for the first time in, in quite a few years, there's a potential that we're going to be fully uh, subscribed to the program by April-ish time. Wow. Um, so what that means to the staff is if I do get fully subscribed, we can't take a vacation at that point with that. Uh, the uniqueness of the training program is that we're asking employers to to predict their activity and what their workforce development needs are. Right? Where where are their oaks? Where are their one of a kinds? Where where is their where are they going to lose these employees? Um, and so we ask for a crystal ball, and I always say recognizing that it's probably more like a snow globe. Right? It gets it's pretty snowy sometimes on my prediction. Be because we're asking for that year's worth of activity there, we also need to be able to amend that activity right to be current within that. So um, we're, we're amending grants based upon activity. Uh, it goes through our review process. Very, very rarely, only on a couple occasions that we've actually added money to the grant. Typically, it's just a training. I didn't like this training provider, or all of a sudden, uh, our, our, we thought our, our manufacturing line was going to be loaded in this direction, but now it's loaded in an opposite direction. So I have to change some of my activities that I need to help Is in. there any preferential guidance for who gets the money? I mean, we talk about the lack of matching jobs to needs. I mean, um, is there industries that are favored at all? So part of our SEDS, right, the, um, has sort of our, our sectors uh, that we're, we're going to support. Uh, statutorily, I believe the language changed four or five years ago. Don't quote me on the four or five years ago to be open to all sectors. I think originally it was primarily manufacturing or production. So um, we're seeing a lot more trades. We're seeing uh, a lot more. Uh, we just did a really neat grant with uh, Green Mountain Transit, who could not find bus drivers and bus mechanics who have hired on a number of new Americans. And we actually, uh, they hit our wages and they hit our benefits, and we helped with ELL training that was specific to that's, um, CDL mechanics. That's a great place to end. I, I was in, no, because I was in Burlington for a meeting with like 15 employers that do new American training and hiring, and that's a real ripe area, it seems to me, for workforce recruitment. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that you're doing that, and maybe we could look at somehow <coughs> enhancing that. Will you update us on that meeting when oh, we return? Yeah, we also have a partnership with a tech center, down, Adult Tech Center in Bennington. That's a great model that I'd love to share that I think we should do. That would be great. I, yeah, I think. There